Hi there. Uh, I've decided to do a video. I knew I was going to do a video, but I've decided to kind of reference what we're going through, what a lot of people are going through, this culture of fear that's been promoted by the media having to do with the COVID-19. Uh, so I just decided I would look at my own life in terms of fear, especially the varieties of fear, or I would like to call it the uses and abuses of fear. So first of all, um, let me say that I have the best credential you could ever have for fear, okay? Because fear dominated my childhood. I was constantly afraid. Started starting when I was two and a half, when my, I think I'd probably said this before, when my dad left for the war, and then, no, he left for the war before that, when I was nine months old, but it was two and a half when I heard about Hiroshima, and I was aware, it's like it woke me up, and it was probably why I came here in the first place onto this planet, was to help prevent what I was so afraid of, uh, which is, you know, the complete destruction of our world, through nuclear war or through pandemics now we could say but whatever they whatever so I, I had an apocalyptic point of view from the time I was a, a very small child and the fear now the thing to remember about fear at least about my fear and I think it's most fear is it's it comes from the mind it is mental and yet it has physical consequences, so that I was constantly in a state of contraction or paralysis, pretending on the outside to be a normal child, pretending to be a kid playing like everybody else. But I had this constant, um, you know, horror show going on inside me that especially would erupt at night when I would have nuclear war, you know, they'd be erupting in my brain, uh, in my dreams, uh, and so forth. So fear is my middle name from the time I was a kid. Unlike any of the other kids in our family, it was just me. Um, okay, so, but it was mental. Remember, it was mental. And I think that usually that is what fear is. It's mental. It stems from the mind and the way the mind works. So I had heard some information. My imagination built it up into something even bigger than it was. Actually, probably not, but I built it up in my mind and it stayed there and completely paralyzed me, completely shut me down. And I was shut down until I was 24 years old. Um, meanwhile, I, was, I became a perfect child, very good, always good, very smart in the, in, in the cultural sense, in the school, school sense. I was brainwashed by my culture very, very successfully. And, you know, that makes me wonder about the fear that people are going through now is it's really for the purpose of brainwashing as far as I'm concerned because they have to get you all on the same page and then they control you with it. Okay, so when I was 24, interestingly enough, I, I performed an experiment. I wonder if I've told you this before, too, of deciding that I wouldn't go to church for three Sundays in a row. Have I talked about this? I don't know. I might have. Anyway, it's in a different context now. So I decided I wouldn't go to church three times in a row to see whether the um, this uh, needing to go to church, because otherwise I'd feel guilty if I didn't go to church and bad, if that was really just a conditioned response. By that time, I was very aware of behaviorism, about, of, of just how the, the psychology works to condition a response. So was it a conditioned response or is it innate? Is it really something I'm supposed to be afraid of? Am I supposed to feel guilty? So I thought, well, after the first, you know, after maybe two times of not going to church on Sunday, I might feel a little bit less guilty. And then by the third time, hopefully I wouldn't feel guilty. But if I still did, then my experiment was a failure and obviously I was meant to continue to go to church. Okay, what happened was after the very first time, I did not feel guilty, and that pissed me off. It's like, oh my God, the whole time I've been doing this because I was told to feel that way a long time ago. So, there I was. I, have, I had performed an experiment, and it was extremely successful. I was kind of stunned by how successful it was. And 
Then, I'm not sure if it was soon after, but not too long after, I decided that um, I would conduct my entire life as an experiment. And furthermore, and here's where the contradiction seems to come in, whatever I'm afraid of, that is what I must do. So, I was afraid of not going to church. And so that stopped me from not going to church until I just confronted the fear and didn't go to church. So whatever I'm afraid of, that's what I must do. I decided that. And what that means is whatever kind of like is bothering me, it makes, I want to do it. There's a part of me that wants to do it, but what if I don't succeed or what if I fall out of favor with my friends or my husband or whoever, but I still have to do it. And so that's what I decided to do because I knew that was the direction of my life. The direction of my life lay in the, in the course of my fears. Again, the fear is just mental, remember. It's not innate. It's mental. It's having to do with the way I've been enculturated. Okay. Now, contrast that with what I would call instinct or instinctive fear, which is extremely appropriate. So my fears were not appropriate at all. They were, they were instilled from the outside through various instructions I was given by the culture, whether it was my parents or the nuns at school or the priest or just the general uh, lay of the land, how people felt about things. But instinctive fear is a very different thing. In fact, instinctive fear, which is, has to do with the body, may not even be fear. It's more like, okay, you need to be alert to this. You need to pay attention to this. And if you're in touch with your body, you will. Let me give you an example. This is a fairly recent example. It's only two years ago. I happened to be up high in the mountains in Siberia with a Siberian uh, man who was kind of a shamanistic type a young man. And I didn't know we were going to do that, but that's what we did. There we were, going up this trail, which got more and more perilous. And I am not a mountain climber. I, I walk, walk on trails. I've been a hiker all my life, but I'm not a climber in, in any kind of dangerous sense. So here I was. And at one point, there was a boulder on one side of a divide and then a boulder on the other side. And he straddled that. It was like a chasm in between. He straddled those two boulders and pat, and he didn't speak English, of course. He patted his knee, meaning I'm supposed to step on his knee to get to the other side. Okay, and he assumed I would do that. And I looked at that and I thought, no, I'm not supposed to do that. Now, maybe 30 years ago I would have done that. 30 years ago I would have had the physical strength to do it, but I know my strength. It's not what it used to be. And I didn't do it. And I remember thinking, well, I just, I knew I couldn't do it. I knew that I would fall if I did it. And it's not that I was afraid. It was just this alertness knowing my limits. That was definitely my limits. And so I didn't do it. And we walked it um, around. Okay. Now, uh, and I think that the physical, the body, which I think is more like alertness, as I said, rather than fear. Fear is usually mental. It may always be mental, actually. But there is a place where the instinct and the intuition come together. In fact, I think if we're really in touch with our bodies, then our, inst our intuition is also alive, is also something we can trust. So let me give you two examples on this. When 9-11 happened, uh, after the first, uh, when I saw the first tower go, I had an instant, absolutely instant internal response to that. Inside job. I knew it right then. I knew it. And it's nothing would have changed my mind. It was like I was an instant response to that. Then, Years later, how long has it been since then? It was 2001, is that right? 2001 was 9-11. Okay, here we are, 2020. When the whole coronavirus thing started, the pan pandemic, my instant response was, 
This is a PSYOP and they are going to use it to try to lock down the police state. It was instant. There was no thinking involved. It's just I knew what they were trying to do. And in that case, I would say that the intuition and the instinct are basically connected. They are actually part of the same stream. Okay, let's go further into that fear that is going on now. Uh, what I notice about myself during this time, and I think a lot of people probably who are uh, sensitive will notice this, even if you're not afraid yourself, you are picking up on, or I am certainly picking up on the collective um, atmosphere of fear. I'm picking up on it. I constantly pick up on it. I constantly have to process it and let it go. I have to constantly breathe through it. It's not mine, but it's there. And so I am swimming in it. There's no way I wouldn't be swimming in it because that's what's going on. That fear. And it's not, I don't think anybody means to be afraid. It's just the constant barrage. It's almost like what we call psychic driving. You know, they just constantly, the the mainstream media just drives it in fear, 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 fear. And if you listen to the mainstream media, that's what's going to happen. Even if you don't, like I never do, but I'm still surrounded by, or not, I mean, immersed in the field, the atmospheric of fear, which is there now, which they utilize to drive us in a certain direction or to try to. Okay, so... Um, then I want to go just a little bit further, and this is this is not fun, into fear. Um, I think if a number of you have probably listened by this time or, or seen the the documentary, um, sh um, what was it called? Something the Shadow. What was it? Out of Shadow, which gives you a little bit of what's been going on with the children that have been um, trafficked and um, brutalized, raped, br brutalized, and often killed. And, um, but before they're killed, uh, their blood is taken because what happens when they're brutalized, of course, is they are terrified. Fear is terror, and what that does is create adrenaline. So the adrenalized blood, apparently, is called adrenochrome, and these elites, um, are drinking it and um, because it, it, it offers it's like the elixir of youth it offers longevity it offers vitality and so that's where that's an abuse of fear clearly I mean so is the whole thing that's going on an abuse of fear but this this is um, something that luckily is coming into the mainstream now or maybe not the mainstream but people are, are hearing about it anyway because that documentary has received after, what has it been, five days, at least five million views, probably more than that at this point. And it reminds me of, I don't know if you've heard of the idea of Loosh, L-O-O-S-H. Apparently, now this, now we're going really far out, but I happen to have a mind that goes in all directions. Um, apparently, if it's the case, and I think it may be, that there is a race or maybe several races of negative ETs that are around, they, they drink, in, they, they pick up psychically the fears of people and it's food for them. So it's like, yeah, again, it's like adrenochrome for the elites. In this case, it's like uh, what they call loosh and it's the emotion of fear that they pick up on and they, they it's food for them. So, that's an interesting uh, abuse of fear also. Okay, um, now going back to CV, uh, what um, alerted me and really made me upset or, you know, alert, just say alert, was the fact that I know that fear is the main thing that um, creates um, disease. Okay, so fear, mental fear, stresses the immune system, stresses the cells, makes them toxic, and therefore you're susceptible to whatever's going on, whatever's been probably latent within you that then blooms into uh, symptoms which they call 
COVID or whatever they want to call it these days. So fear is a, a very important indicator that the immune system is being stressed. So anybody who is in fear, if you're in fear, it's really important to breathe through it, to let it go, to recognize it, to notice it, to notice that you are living in that atmosphere. And it's not necessary to do that, even though you have to constantly clear it because it's in, it's in other people too. Okay, so I just want to end here with all of us recognizing that there really are only two emotions, okay? One contracts, one makes us, might, makes us, you know, go inside ourselves, makes us hide, makes us paralyzed, and that's called fear. We can also project that fear, or the fear of the other, and then hate them, so hate is projected fear. But fear is, it is one emotion, and the other one is love. Those are the only choices. We can be in fear, or we can be in love, and love expands. Love explores. Love is here with all of us. Love actually has compassion for those people that are in fear. Love has compassion for the fact that you and I and all of us who are sensitive are picking up on others' fear and have to constantly process it even though we don't want to. But we still have compassion for the fact that so many people are in fear. And remember, it's mental. Ultimately, it's mental. It's how your mind works. So it depends on what you're putting into your mind. What you're allowing in is going to determine your emotional state. The mind is first. Disease comes as a result of that.